Hello and welcome to today's pronunciation webinar. This is Sophie from English Australia. Uh, if you can hear me and see the PowerPoint slide on your screen, can you please just type in yes? Wonderful. So it seems getting lots of yeses. So it seems like we're all ready to go. Um, well, thank you to today's presenter, Michael Burry. Um, we're delighted that you could come in and do the webinar for us today. Michael is a PhD candidate and lecturer in the School of Education at the University of Wollongong. Um, I think some congratulations are actually in order because Michael recently um, handed in his PhD. So uh, hopefully everything is on track with that. Uh, Michael lectures at, uh, in TESOL at the University of Wollongong and at this semester he's actually taking two subjects, pronunciation and assessment. Michael has also taught and conducted research in Japan, Canada and Australia um, and he's presented on pronunciation teaching at many regional, national and international conferences. So um, we're very happy that you could come in and present for us today. I'm going to pass over to Michael now. Uh, we're going to have questions at the end of the session, probably for about the last 10 or 15 minutes. So if you do have questions, please save them up and you can ask Michael at the end. Thanks, Sophie. And uh, thanks to all of you for joining. Um, I'm delighted that you were able to join and I hope that uh, you'll be able to walk away with some practical techniques at the end of this seminar that you could implement tomorrow morning. And uh, and you can see my email there up on the screen. Uh, of course, you're welcome to ask questions and we're trying to answer them at the end of this session. But if you um, have other questions or want to stay in touch and, and whatnot, then you just email me and I'll be happy to email. Of course, you can also tweet it, but uh, email is maybe a bit more <laughs> private. But uh, yeah, so all right. Let's get started here. Um, just a quick overview of what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit shop and uh, talk, establish some sort of baseline from where we go in terms of thought groups and prominence. And then uh, we'll look at several techniques and then wrap it up with one slide on integrate, integrating pronunciation. Uh, but I thought I'll start off with a little bit, I contextualize it a little bit and you'll see why, uh, because uh, pronunciation is often done decontextualized. So I thought I'll contextualize this workshop a little bit and uh, tell you a little bit what, what I am, who I am in, in light of pronunciation. I was born in the US and I was five when we moved to Switzerland and my parents spoke to me in Swiss German in, in the US, but I got off the plane and and I remember getting off the plane in Zurich and I couldn't understand anybody, even though they were speaking Swiss German to me. So from a very early age on, an accent became very uh, a big thing in my life. And then uh, when I was 22, I flew to Japan and got a, jo a job teaching English in, in Osaka. I sat across from an immigration officer and and with a full-time contract and, he, and I showed him my Swiss passport. And he looked at it and he said, in perfect English, uh, with a Japanese accent, of course, he said, what's a Swiss student teaching English in Japan? And I, I realized, oops, he's not going to issue my work visa. So I pulled out my American passport and he looked at it, stamped it and said, welcome to Japan. <laughs> and I thought, that's weird. What's going on here? And so that interest sort of then over the years, that interest in accents and pronunciation led me to do my graduate work with, uh, in TESOL with Bill Acton, and you might have heard of Bill. He's working in, in the area of kinesthetic, uh, tactile pronunciation instruction. And that then led me to UOW to do my graduate work in uh, uh, pronunciation instruction. More specifically, I'm looking at how people like yourself learn to teach pronunciation, and what this means uh, in terms of their application, classroom application. So a lot of the stuff we're going to talk about today is is directly related to my own experience and you may find this useful a little bit. Okay, so what, what are we going to look at it? Uh, I thought maybe we'll have a quick look at uh, general issues in pronunciation instruction. 
um, of course, pronunciation, as you as you all know, is critical in communication. If if the teacher or if you can't understand the students or the students cannot understand you, there's communication breakdown. What's very interesting is that we find in research has, has shown that uh, native speakers and non-native speakers find pronunciation teaching to be extremely challenging. And no matter what your language background is, uh, teachers lack confidence and therefore avoid pronunciation instruction. Um, one big question, of course, is uh, what model should we teach? Should we teach American English? Should we teach Australian English? What about Japanese English? What about Nigerian English? And uh, Linda Yates and Beth Sidlinski here in Australia do great work. And what we do now is basically uh, we teach the, your model, the, the teacher's model. So we don't need to uh, try and uh, imit imitate an American or an Australia, but we just teach the model that the teacher teaches. And that takes a bit of the pressure of, of us language teachers. Um, one other issue is that pronunciation is very rarely included in textbooks, particularly uh, today's workshop talking about uh, fluency and, and rhythm techniques. Uh, fluency is neglected in textbooks. Um, there's some minimal pairs and, and segmentals, but fluency is it is a big need. Uh, if teachers teach pronunciation, it's often uh, uh, they focus too much on vowels or consonants or too much on stress and rhythm. What we really need is, is a balance. So this workshop is mostly about super segmentals, but that doesn't mean uh, segmentals uh, need to be uh, or don't need to be taught. In fact, it's, it's very beneficial to teach both. And another issue is that in the classroom, pronunciation is often taught decontextualized, meaning uh, it's if we have five minutes at the end of the lesson, we may do a little bit of uh, repetition or drills. Um, and that's, we know now from research, classroom-based research in the last five to 10 years that this is really uh, ineffective. Pronunciation needs to be integrated in all uh, classrooms and all skill areas. Um, my own work is a lot in, uh, in, in gesture-based instruction, kinesthetic-based teaching. Um, we know that unsystematic gestures are very distracting and uh, they, they don't help the learners uh, en enhance their pronunciation. So we need to have systematic kinesthetic uh, teaching. I'll talk a little bit more at the end of this workshop or at the end of the session. Um, and one, one other thing is uh, many teachers and many uh, administrators in, in many different contexts often think pronunciation is too time consuming or it's too expensive. We don't have uh, money to, imp uh, to install programs in the computer labs. But hopefully by the end of the session, you'll get some techniques that can be used very quickly and, and that are not time consuming and then they're free. So I uh, maybe uh, debunked that myth a little bit at the end of this uh, seminar. Have a look at this. In terms of rhythm and fluency, why, why do we need to work on rhythm? It's because, as you see, uh, Judy Gilbert's uh, quote that I really like is um, that speech rhythms are very deeply ingrained, they're deeply rooted in the minds of our students um, from a very early age on. And so we need to help our students to, to overcome that and sort of reprogram their bodies so they can use this very unique rhythm of the English language. And then down here, got Anton and Sigalovitz, they define fluency as something smooth and rapid with undue hesitation and pauses that result from constant use and rep repetitive practice. That's not drills or, or repeat after me, but that's uh, one particular feature of pronunciation uh, used in multiple different tasks repetitively so the students get multiple exposure in, in, in different tasks. That eventually then leads into enhanced pronunciation and intelligibility. So this, these two definitions very much form um, sort of the, the point of departure for this session. Um, Another thing that I would like to uh, mention, and you can access Judy Gilbert's uh, book that's free online. You can download it. I think you have to go through the TESOL website now. That it's posted there. But if you just Google it, you'll find it. What Judy's work um, uh, is, is very influential, and she bases um, the, everything on this 
on this prosody pyramid, what we're going to do today is we're going to work on uh, with thought groups and focus word or, or prominence, as I as I call it in this session. So we're going to work not in peak vowels and with peak vowels and stressed syllables, but well, maybe a little bit with stressed syllables, but mostly thought groups and prominence. So this is, um, if you, some of you may know this, if you've got a linguistics background or if you've done a, a graduate degree in TESOL, you, you know some of this. But to teach rhythm effectively, you need to have an understanding of what a thought group is. It's, it's a coherent group of words. Um, and it's within that group of words, there's always one word or it could be a, a syllable that's stronger and louder than the rest. So things like, um, if you look at the bottom here, this book is on the table. This, this is one thought group, a long one, and table is the, the longer and louder words. For um, maybe less proficient students, we can split that up or parse it into two thought groups. The book is on the table, then the book is one, a thought group and is on the table is a, th a second thought group with book and table being the louder words. Then if the students are beginners, we could uh, technically split it up even more. The book is on the table. Then we have three thought groups with three um, longer, uh, sorry, louder words. So this is thought groups and that's important uh, also because um, we need to give the listeners uh, in this case, your students, we need to give them time to process the information. I'm sure you've met people that have talked with very long thought groups or no thought groups at all. And very soon you realize your cognitive ability just shuts down because there's too much information coming at you. So we need to help the students pause and then they become more comprehensible and uh, and also, of course, for the speaker, the speaker has to breathe once in a while. And these thought groups uh, are definitely uh, helping in that regard, too. So what, what I do with my academic students, um, I give them these guidelines. And you're welcome to use them in your classes, of course. I, I give them as at the beginning of a, of a course, a speaking course, for example. I give them these um, thought groups with... Uh, and present them and they bring them to class. And then when we work with text or we work on exercises, they can always refer to these thought groups. So um, just some very basic uh, guidelines here. They, I don't want to call them rules, but um, because rules, they just, when we work with second language teaching, in second language teaching, rules seldom apply. Uh, so guidelines are, give, give us a little bit more flexibility. So they usually, thought groups are usually separated by pauses. They, have, they usually have a grammatical coherent structure. There's always a prominent word, as, as we just saw on the last slide. And they're separated by punctuation. For lower level learners, um, they can be shorter, but no, I would say no longer than seven syllables. It just becomes too complex. And at the bottom, you can see there's an example in this presentation. Pause. I'm going to talk about pause. Teaching techniques. Pause. So that those are typical thought groups. So from thought groups, then we need to uh, also look at prominence. And prominence, as I said, is that louder words within a thought group. Uh, unfortunately, um, in our field, terminology is always a bit problematic. So de depending on what you read or who you read, they use different terms. So Acton uses focal stress. Judy Gilbert uses focal words. Then there's primary stress. There's nuclear stress. I use prominence here. But in essence, they're all the same. It's a louder word, a stronger word within a thought group. Okay, so again, I give the students guidelines that they uh, frequently refer to and they bring them to class. Um, guidelines, prominence often changes for emphasis. By that, I mean, for example, I like chocolate versus I like chocolate versus I like chocolate. And so you convey different meanings uh, depending on how you uh, change or shift prominence. And that's, we need to teach that to our students. Um, 
prominence is located, generally located on new information. Um, it's on content words such as um, adjectives, nouns, verbs. It's words um, on words expressing negation. If all else fails, if the students really don't know, or maybe yourself, we're not sure where it occurs, then it tends to be at the end of a thought group towards the right. That that's the that's the unique uh, rhythm of the English language. That's sort of like a a wave. And uh, so if 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 you do some sort of perceptive task where the students have to identify prominence, as we'll do in a minute. Um, it tends to be there at the end. Um, so, of course, controlled by the story, as I said above here, it changes for emphasis. And down here, the example, it's the same example as we've just looked at, just with thought groups, and then you have prominent words, also the, the bolded ones with uh, in blue, the typical exercise uh, that our students can uh, work with. Okay, so have a look at um, this one. So then, now we're going to, um, we're looking at, uh, already we'll look at some application of this. What, what we can do, um, for example, the teacher can read a sort of fixed text, a dialogue, or maybe even a paragraph in the reading class. Uh, the teacher can read it to the students, and the students identify pauses with these, I think dashes work quite well, and then identify prominence. You may want to read the text to them several times. First you do uh, thought groups two or three times and then you do prominence. Or um, you do a bit more inductively. You give a text to the students and then they parse it themselves and they identify prominence and there's always great discussion uh, and, and you can sort of take on a facilitative role and help the students in that process and then they can perform some sort of role play afterwards. Um, there's a little bit of dialogue I put put together for you, maybe spend a couple of seconds and uh, parsing this into thought groups. Of course, the sentences here, they're very short, so in essence every sentence is a, a thought group, but um, see if you can identify prominence. Um, I'll just do this for a second, it's not a test. I'll give you the answer in a few seconds too. Okay, so that's something you can do with your students. Every textbook, if you if you teach in an Elicos uh, program, if you teach an IELTS class, uh, whatever, if you use a, a textbook, then there's dialogues in there, and you can use these dialogues and have the students parse them up into thought groups and identify prominence. So this is the answer. Is this what you uh, came up with possibly but what you can see uh, what I like about this example here is that y you see how prominence shifts how it's located on new information how the story controls prominence I lost my wallet what color is it it was black black leather there was a black wallet in the car which car the one I sold all right, so the students get a bit of an idea how prominence is used to convey new meaning and how the how these words how the prominence shifts depending on the on the story so you can do that with dialogues and of course you can do this with longer dialogues and instead of just asking you again I just thought I'd present it to you but this is a dialogue I've used in, in a, I think at the PD fest as well um, just a standard dialogue about A is doing really well, coming home, B is very sick, not feeling too well. And so the story again controls prominence and, and thought group use. And, and that, that's good. We'll look at it again a little bit later about dialogue work. But of course, you can map other things onto like intonation and, and uh, expressiveness and attitude and so on. But I think thought groups and prominence, they, they, they form a really nice uh, framework uh, for uh, uh, fluency and, and rhythm teaching. Okay. Um, another tool that you uh, could use is Judy Gilbert's Kazoo. And unfortunately, I, I just realized that I forgot mine, so I can't really show you how it's used, but it's very simple. It's a it's as Judy says here, it's it's basically a tool 
for helping your learners focus on pitch patterns. Um, so it's, you hum a melody. And of course, to, in order to do that, you have to, uh, the learners have to identify thought groups and prominence. And you could use that same dialogue uh, using the kazoo. So it would be something like, uh, as a, uh, the, the second one works. Uh -huh, is something wrong? Uh -huh. So they, they do that with a kazoo and it increases their phonological awareness. But in order to do it right, of course, they have to put more emphasis on wrong. And it's if you have large classes, it may be a bit chaotic. So when I, when I was in Japan, we had 60 students in a class. Doing this with 60 students is not only a cost factor because you don't want to buy 60 kazoos, but imagine 60 students doing this at once. It's a... It's loud and interesting, but it is a good tool because the students, um, if they don't do it well, you can hear it instantaneously and their, their classmates can hear it too. So this, the kazoo is a powerful uh, tool. Judy always does this at uh, the TESOL convention and she brings in a whole suitcase full of kazoos. It's hilarious. Uh, good stuff. She also uses the rubber band. And um, I do this with me with my graduate students. They really like this because it's it's practical, it's cheap. I just picked up a, a big bag of uh, rubber bands at Bunnings. But what you want to do is you buy the thick ones, not the not the office, the, the thing, the small ones. They they uh, they're not very uh, they don't last very long. But the thick ones are really good. And what you do is you put them between as as the picture down here shows uh, this one here. Um, you put them between your thumbs and then stretch it out on the prominent syllable. So, for example, again, we're going back to the dialogue work that we looked at before. What's the problem? The problem, that's when you stretch out the rubber band. I got the flu a week ago. So you maybe you overemphasize prominence a little bit. But again, it's a kinesthetic element that is, I think, much more effective than just repeating after the teacher because you engage multiple senses. And the rubber band is, is great. Um, and you can, again, you can do that with all sorts of, all sorts of text-based um, uh, materials. You could use it in spontaneous speech, but it is a little bit challenging. Um, if you get really good at it, uh, I guess you can you can do that. But to help your learners just get a bit of an understanding of what the prominence is, uh, text-based is, is very useful. So you can use the kazoo, the rubber bands, and then we got many more techniques. You can use the whispering techniques uh, technique, which I just did with a bunch of students from Hong Kong. They really like that. So what, what you do here is you, you have, say, a dozen students line up standing next to each other. And uh, the first student create, comes up with some sentence. Uh, usually I tell them to uh, make a sentence that consists of two to three thought groups. So uh, say, I went to the store I, and I bought an apple and and some chocolate. So you have three thought groups, store, apple, chocolate. Those are the prominent words. And uh, then the first student whispers that to the student next to him or her. And then it just sort of keeps going. The, the, the student whispers again, 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 again. It travels down uh, that line. And then at the end, the last student has to uh, tell the rest of the group what he or she heard. Of course, if there's a breakdown in communication or if um, what often happens is the sentence actually changes the meaning quite uh, dramatically because they... Uh, either mispronounce things or they change prominence or they don't pronounce things clearly. And so it's, it's a it's a fun activity. There's often a lot of laughter involved. And you can go back then and see where did the, the, the pronunciation, where did the communication break down and then you can look at it and uh, maybe do it again or use the same uh, sentence using different words. So you can be as creative as you want, but it is, it's, a, it's a good technique that you can... Uh, in, include in your classes. The uh, another one that I've done quite a few times is uh, you have a group of students, maybe 10, 12 students, stand in a circle and they face each other, and then again they have to say something, and 
but then throw the ball and, and maybe use a beach ball, not a not a tennis ball, that because a beach ball is easy to catch. But the idea is that the student that says, uh, say, I bought an apple, throws the ball on apple, and that's not easy to do because you have to say it, you have to think about it, you have to uh, emphasize uh, the, the prominent word and throw the ball at the same time. So there's multiple senses engaged again, and then the, the other student that catches the ball uh, again, makes up some sort of sentence. You may want to provide some guidelines or get some some template sentences they can use. Again, that student with the ball then says something else. I, I didn't do any homework and throws the ball on homework. And then another student catches and goes forth and back, forth and back. Again, uh, a nice activity to uh, work on. Uh, the, the rhythm, we're working on rhythm, not so much fluency, it's, it's rhythm. Um, Another thing I did was uh, that the third bullet here is you can have students standing next to each other and uh, usually do it in, in pairs, but they uh, stand next to each other. And when, when you say you've done a paragraph or a, a, a dialogue where they parsed in the text into thought groups and identify prominence, they read it out loud. So it's, tech, it's sort of a, an oral, a call reading exercise. They read it out loud together and then take a step on the prominent syllable. Um, so if we go back to the dialogue up here, what's the problem? So they, they, they have this, probably the worksheet or the, the dialogue in front of them. They, they read it out loud. What's the problem? And then prop, they step forward. I got the flu and they take another step. So it's, it's, a, it's a good way to, um, again, a kinesthetic way of uh, working, having your students work on prominence. It, it does require a bit of classroom space, obviously. So what, I, uh, what I've done when I taught in, in Canada in an EAP program, or like an Elecos program, we often went outside and when it was nice outside, there's a few nice days in the summer in Canada, then uh, you can go outside and do this, uh, and, and the students just love walking around and, and taking steps on prominent words. Um, but again, it requires to, some sort of guidelines that you need to work with uh, the, the thought group guidelines and the prominent guidelines, prominence guidelines. Um, the last one is a bit more inductive, but you could use dots to highlight uh, uh, and practice the use of prominence. So let's have a look at that. I cut that out. I used this from, uh, I used, this is in Hahn and Dickerson's work, uh, book. Uh, it's, it's, it's a bit, you know, it's almost 20 years old, but it's, it's still uh, a good resource and it's, the, the target population is advanced academic learners. So it's, uh, it's not for beginners, it's for advanced learners, but it, it, it has excellent exercises, things like, do you have a computer? And that's the prominent prominence here. Yes, I do. Do you have one? No, I don't. So these are the, the prominent words. Now, of course, we could, they don't parse them into thought groups. We could put a slash here. Um, but you get the idea of this. Then questions they have to go and ask each other. Do you do you like chemistry? That's the prominent word, chemistry. Yes, I do, or no, I don't. Do you like it? No, I don't. Yes, I do. So there's a dialogue in, involved. It's less uh, constraint or there's less um, guidelines. There's the, the fixed dialogue I just showed you. It's a bit more open. It's, it's what I would say call guided practice, where you, you as a teacher provide less um, support where they go and play with the language uh, themselves. So these are excellent exercises and and you can use a dot. I, I use a bold and underline, but any kind of visual uh, uh, support you can give to help the students uh, identify focal stress and then and then play with it and, and work with it. So they so the dots and then I think I got one more slide. Ah, oh, what I um, really like is Wakaru. Some of you may know Wakaru. That's if not, have a quick look. You can log on, uh, or log on, I should say, Google it and uh, search for Wakaru. What I really like about it is you get a the students record their speech and then they can send it to you, and it's not an attachment. You just get a link, and you can click on it, 
and it takes you directly to this clip. So you, it doesn't clutter up your inbox. You, we all know students emailing us speech clips that are 20, 15, 20 megs large, and you get an inbox that's filled up and then emails bounce. With Walkeroo, it's you just get a link. It's, it's a really nice tool. And and what, what, we, uh, what I have done is they had to record, I had to give them a task. So you've got to give them a little bit, you've got to scaffold them a little bit here and provide them guidance, but they had to uh, record the speech for two or three minutes. And then they had to, uh, in class, they had to listen to it. We went to the computer lab, they listened to it, they parsed the text, they had to transcribe it as homework, bring it to class and then parse it up uh, based on what they said, not what they should have said, but what they said and what, the, what and identify the prominence. And then uh, quickly they, they realized, oh, I use too many thought groups or stress every word equally strong. So there's really every word is in essence prominence. And, and then we looked at it, uh, uh, we, we uh, looked at it sort of, how, how could you say it? Once they, they analyzed their own speech. And I think that's a very valuable um, exercise. If time's an issue in your program, of course you can do it as homework. And then you would need to some sort of, maybe need to assign a mark uh, or else they'll do it. But that's up to you. Um, another fluent, that's a, a more fluency based technique is in Paul Nation's uh, uh, listening and speaking, Nation and Newton's list, teaching listening and speaking it is, four, three, two techniques. You have um, say 20 students in your class, you form two uh, lanes of chairs, you have, you have so you, you just form 10 chairs in each uh, line facing each other and so you have 10 pairs, each pair facing each other, and you give them a, a story. To, um, to, for example, they have to uh, talk about the scariest moment, uh, something they're emotionally attached to often works well because it's it's easy for them to talk about. So um, they, they face each other. The first, uh, say the left row, talks for four minutes and the other row listens. And uh, so you have 10 students talking at the same time, it's quite loud, and 10 students listen. And then once they're done, you reverse the listeners talk for three minutes, uh, four minutes, and then the, the, the previous talkers listens. Once that's done, everyone moves one chair to the right, so they get a new partner, and then they do the same story for three minutes. And again, one talks, the other one listens, and then you change. Then again, they jump one chair to the right, have new partners, and then you do the same task in two minutes. And what's really good about this is that um, there's a time constraint here. So the students have less time to talk, but because they have this, uh, have done their talk twice already, they should become more fluent. And this is, um, as I said, I just had a group of student teachers from Hong Kong. We did this for about an hour and they just absolutely loved it. And it was really interesting um, talking to them afterwards and they felt that it enhanced their fluency enormously because they could tell the same story uh, over and over, but they had a different audience and they had to do it more quickly. So it's a very nice fluency task. And the, 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 the last one here is attending skills. You have students in a group of four and uh, one talks, one listens, and then you have two observers. The, uh, the talker, you give him again, him or her, a, a topic. Um, you, with this, I usually I give the students a few minutes to think about a topic and then they, I need to approve it because um, it is not an easy task to just talk about something. So they give the topic to me, I say, yes, that's good. Maybe you want to think about something else. Um, uh, but you go around, approve these topics, and then the talker talks for three minutes and the listener listens. But but as you know, in conversation, listening is also a skill that that is often not taught in, in oral communication. So the, the listener has to uh, attend and, and facilitate uh, the talker. So um, there can be this numerous strategies, gestures, there's a uh, back channeling, you can ask questions and, and, and so on and so on. Um, but you also have two listeners, one, uh, sorry, two observers. One observer focus on the, the speaker, uh, meaning he or she focuses on the, the talker's pronunciation. Are there any pronunciation issues? The other observer focuses on the listener. What type of strategies did the listener use to maintain the flow of the, of that talk? That's very interesting because, um, you'll, you'll, you'll see 
in, in a minute what, I, what I'm getting at. But you do, you do this for four minutes, and then the two observers go up to the front of the, board, uh, of the classroom, and hopefully you've got two whiteboards. One is for the observer one, one is for the observer two, and they write things down. All the pronunciation issues that the talker had gets written down, and all the strategies the listener has used get written down. And then uh, maybe you do this four times, so each one gets a turn, and by the end of this, it usually takes about a a solid hour to do that. You have a, just a beautiful resource on uh, on these two whiteboards up front, and you can talk to the students about the pronunciation issues. You can talk about listening skills and uh, the attending skills, really, to what the listeners applied. And uh, again, it's a fluency activity, but it, it's much more than that because you can focus on very specific pronunciation issues and, and also, of course, the listening strategy. It's a really nice uh, attending skill. It's a really nice activity. And uh, Acton and Cope, Bill Acton and, and uh, his mother-in-law is this. Uh, that's, uh, that's an interesting detail. Uh, they wrote up this paper. And uh, you can, I think it's available online. If not, I'd be happy to send it to you. Or you could email Bill, and I'm sure he'd be happy to send it to you as well. It's a good activity. So let's look at some. And if you've been in one of the workshops I did at uh, um, the PD Fest in Sydney or the one I did in, at the PD Fest in Melbourne, you know uh, what haptic means. I'm going to do at the English Australia conference, some of you might be there, I'm going to do a haptic pragmatics workshop. Um, I'm, the emphasis should be on, I'm trying to do this, it's something new, but what it is, basically haptic is a systematic combination of movement and touch. As I said before in pronunciation teaching, the, uh, the systematic side is, is often not there because uh, we teachers tend to, to use random gestures. But what we're trying to do is we're trying to come up with a system that's systematic and that includes movement and touch. And that's a whole group of us. That's Bill Acton, that's Amanda Baker at the uh, University of Wollongong, there's Brian Team in, in Japan, and then we've got a couple of people in, in uh, China and uh, some more in Canada. So it's a whole group of people that, that's been working on this. But again, what it is, it, it oops, sorry. It's a, it's a, you integrate all the senses except smell. I hadn't figured out how to do this yet. But you integrate sight, sound, movement, touch systematically. And it's a, experiential in a sense. Uh, it's learning by doing. And I included several links in this uh, presentation, so you, I recommend or suggest you do is click on these links afterwards so you get a bit of a sense what, what this is all about. And that, of course, haptics is, is everywhere. Now, if you've got a smartphone, it's you, you touch the smartphone, that's haptics. It's in, in surgery. The gaming industry is massive. Um, or haptic cinema, if you've gone to these, these uh, full... Uh, a body experiential type of cinemas that's haptic so it's it's really all over the world now it's, it's in daily life it's it's everywhere and there's a for some demo videos just go to the bill acton's website he's got some free demo videos to show you but i'll i'll talk i'll it's a bit difficult to talk about an experiential uh teaching technique or techniques uh in a webinar but the, the vid links should give you a good idea of what, what these are. And the, so one is the butterfly, and I think it's is it the English Australia April issue. I think it was. Where Amanda and I wrote up a paper. It's a it's a short uh, paper. It's not not intensive. It's not not. It doesn't take much time to read. It's just a description of of the butterfly technique. So you can access this. Of course, it's free online. And you can access the journal and read about it a little bit. But what it is, is we want to help the learners feel the syllables. And then especially the prominent syllables, the prominent words. And so what you do here is your left hand is on your, your right shoulder. And the, the right hand is on the left uh, forearm or, or the elbow, I think. And the left hand 
um, taps the, the the right shoulder, and that that's the prominent syllable. Whereas the le the the right hand taps the the left uh, elbow, that's the weak syllable. So we really emphasize. We tell um, we work with students so they experience and feel the the prominent syllable. And as as you know, if you have Japanese students or Italian students or a German students or Swiss students, you know that in their native language they stress. The syllables, the, the the syllables are equally long. They stress them equally long, and so for for these type, for these learners, they really need to feel that that in English we have this the, the prominence to convey meaning, and that's a good way to um, to help these students feel the prominent syllable. And again, there's a couple of demo articles, and oh, here is the Australia English Australia Journal article. You just click on this, and it takes you straight to this piece that we wrote up. Um, you can again, if you have a textbook, you can work with dialogues. Uh, the, the little dots are the weak syllables that are in on the elbow, and the, the big circles are the prominent syllables that are on the shoulder, and the students attend and, and do these uh, kinesthetically. It's now granted it does take a little bit of practice. It's not the easiest thing. Uh, but once you've done it a few times, usually the students are much better than the teachers, but if you've done it a few times, it, it is a, a good exercise to work on, on to get help the students feel the, the rhythm of the English language. And you can do this with free practice too. You can uh, have questions. Again, you can see up here I part, a long question. I parsed it into uh, two thought groups with two prominent uh, words up here. And then an answer again, two thought groups, two prominent words. Um, and the students can make their own questions. They can parse it into thought groups, identify prominence, and then they go around and ask people uh, questions using the butterfly. But then also the students on uh, answering the questions, they also have to use the butterfly. So it's a, it's a fun way to to experience the English rhythm. And then a bit more fluency based is um, is uh, the the Rhythm Fight Club. That's uh, again you can click on. Uh, Bill Acton's uh, website and there's, there's, a dem there's demo videos. But what it is, you um, you uh, in the right hand, for example, you hold a, a tennis ball, or, or you don't have to have a ball, but it's it helps the students focus a bit, and you move out, um, much like a, if you're into martial arts like karate, you move out on the prominent syllable. And if you look at the demo video, you know exactly what I mean. And the focus is not so much on the unstressed syllables anymore, like the butterfly on the elbow, but that the emphasis shifts now towards the, the more prominent syllable where we punch on the uh, prominent syllables. It's just, just a word of caution here, if you teach migrants or refugees, you may want to change the word uh, fight club because it is a bit sensitive. What, what I done with in the Amy P program, for example, I taught in, in Wollongong, we called it the rhythm ball club, just um, because we had uh, a lot of uh, migrants and refugees, and they they really like that. Um, uh, just uh, just you got to be a bit. We all we know what this is. Language teaching. We have to be a bit sensitive to the, to our learners. And again, free practice. You just have a question here, um, and instead of now using the butterfly, they they move forward and punch on the uh, prominent syllables, and you can have the students make questions. Um, and you can be as creative as you want. Dialogue work again, you have a dialogue, the weak ones are, well, the, the circle, the big circles are the ones where they move out on the, on the prominent syllable and punch on the, on the prominent syllable. Um, it does require space, so if you have a very small classroom with a very with a lot of learners, you gotta spread them out and make sure that they don't punch each other. Free practice, I just mentioned that. Oops, I'm going backwards, I think. Am I? Ah, so to finish off, I, I, uh, this is the last slide, and then the floor, floor is yours. You can ask some questions. But integration of pronunciation is still uh, a bit of an issue, of course, as, as we saw at the beginning, because uh, pronunciation as an add-on, sort of an as appendix, is just not good enough. If we spend a minute at the beginning and maybe five minutes at the end. Of course, it's better than nothing, but it's overall, it's just not sufficient enough for the learners to improve. So what we need to do is we need to include 
uh, pronunciation into all sorts of skill areas. Listening is, is critical because um, as we know now, prominence, through prominence, meaning is conveyed. So if we have a listening class, I, I often teach prominence in the listening class because students don't need to listen to every word. They just need to listen to the prominent word. Uh, that's the main piece of information. And the same can be said for reading. We all know students read now, they try to read every word, but there's really no need for this. They just need to focus on the keywords, on the prominent words, because those words convey meaning. It's a reading strategy, but it's directly linked to pronunciation. Um, and we can in introduce pronunciation even at the very lowest level, beginning levels. Um, with very basic texts, you can read these texts to the students and they can circle the, the stronger words. So you, so you need to maybe, um, uh, you don't want to call it prominence, you don't need to give them the meta language, but um, you can read it to them and they identify um, the prominent word and then you can have some sort of systematic gesture to, to go with it when they say the word. Maybe they can step take a step forward on the prominent word and we, we did uh, with the uh, in the AMEP program, we worked with very basic level, uh, uh, zero English level actually uh, learners and they still really enjoyed it. I think Linda Yates is, uh, what is it, the book is maybe in the reference list. That one has some really good exercises with uh, for, for lower level uh, learners. And as I said, it needs to be in integrated because, of course, pronunciation is critical in terms of instruction and discussion. If they, uh, students need to uh, talk in a group and they're in unintelligible, then pronunciation is a massive uh, uh, issue. And these days in, in the regular English language uh, classroom, discussion is a key component. Um, last one, I think it's the last one, the Cicola and and Darcy, oh, I, th I think that's a sp I spelled it wrongly, should be Darcy here, uh, we have a very nice book chapter on the integration of pronunciation. And I really like this quote, that pronunciation becomes integrated when successful task completion crucially depends on the target form accuracy. Meaning, um, when you have a task, uh, and, and so task-based learning is, is very big in language teaching, now, but when you have the learners engage in some form of task, if the task completion, if the success of this task depends on some, some form of pronunciation item, then it is the integration. Because then you can see, uh, oh, there's a misunderstanding. This caused a communication breakdown in this task. You can address it uh, and, and, and some sort of quick, with a quick technique, a quick pronunciation technique. And that's really the 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 essence of pronunciation integration. So on that note, I think we are right on time. We do have time for questions. So um, I think you can type, there's a box where you can type questions. And uh, if I, I'll read the questions out, if there's questions, and then I try and answer them. And if I can't, uh, I'll definitely get back to you later on. Maybe you need to process some of this content. <laughs> Maybe they just have comments as well. Or comments, of course, as well. Um, if you got comments, if you thoughts, concerns, of course, um, as well. <laughs> I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, it says, I... 
any uh, so there's a question here any advice for helping students recognize the need for accurate, accurate pronunciation as cohorts often seem able to understand each other and therefore can't see a problem with their pronunciation ah that's a good question yes um, well basically uh, Yes, it's true. Within the classroom, uh, the students do understand each other very well. But what what I do um, with with my academic classes or e even the regular ESL classes um, is uh, there's some sort of out of class component where they have to design a survey, and then in in that part they have to make questions, and then we work on prominence. Uh, in a sense that they have to identify the, the strongest word within that questions, but then question, but we also work on intonation. And then they have to go outside and, and talk to people, interview these people, and uh, they'll recognize very soon that if they don't pronounce these questions accurately, and if they don't engage, if they're unintelligible in that conversation, they have a serious issue. And they often come back to class and a little bit frustrated, they come, they, they come back and say, they couldn't. People we talked to, we couldn't. Understand, they couldn't understand me, and that gives you a good baseline to work from. And so, out of class uh, tasks are very helpful. Of course, some uh, schools are a bit hesitant to send the schools outside, uh, the, the, the students outside. But I, I find these um, it stretches, it pushes them a little bit, it gets them out of the comfort zone too. So that, that's maybe one way. And if I can think of any other ways, I'll, I'll come back to that. But that's a great question. Um, there's a few more questions. Do you have any references for helping, helping Vietnamese speakers? Uh, yes, I, I think you probably uh, uh, refer to uh, their problems with uh, pronouncing final consonants. That is a huge, uh, huge area. And uh, I, I love working with Vietnamese people. Uh, they, they're just great people, but they're unintelligible. To most, to the, most of them are just really difficult to understand because of their native language. Their Vietnamese does not have final consonants. And that's, that's an area I'm really interested in, but I unfortunately, I don't have any, um, I don't have any, a whole lot of answers because I think the field just doesn't have a whole lot of answers at the moment. Um, I'm working on, I'm sort of tossing around the idea with uh, stretching out the vowel sounds before vo uh, final consonants because it gives them the students, gives the students more time to think about that there's something coming afterwards. So for example, I went to bed so that that vowel sound, bad, you stretch it out, and then of course you have a voiced consonant there at the end. It just gives them a little bit more time to pronounce that. But I, I don't have any empirical uh, evidence to support this, but it's a great research area. But I will, I will get back to this if you have any, feel free to email me. I think Paul, you have asked that question. Yeah, please feel free to email me. And there's a bunch of Vietnamese doctoral students in my department that, that may have some answers. Uh, was that Linda Yates from Macquarie Uni you were referring to? Yes, that's Linda Yates. And if you Google her, there'll be lots of resources she has uh, available online. And I think there's a couple of, or at least one of the resources in her, in the bibliography that I, in the reference list at the end. And there's a question, another one. With prominence practice for thought groups, is humming an effective alternative? Has anyone tried this? Yes. Humming is basically the same as the kazoo. Uh, humming is an, a little bit cheaper, obviously, because you don't need the device. But it, it does work. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it's exactly the same principle. And uh, it's it's quite easy to do. And, and maybe you can have the student hum a text to you, and then you'll see whether that actually corresponds with with what you have in front of you. So yes, that's a good it's a good technique. Would you recommend the butterfly technique as possibly as a possibility? Sorry, as a possibility for the beginner level. Um, yes, it can be done. Um, beginners generally, I find beginners they don't need 
a whole lot of justification for doing something. So you, you demonstrate something and the students do it. Um, with more advanced students, then they, they, they often want to know why they have to do something. But you can do it with uh, low-level students. Again, we did it with the AMEP uh, students, and, and it worked okay uh, as long as you just you need more time. You need to have you need to be a bit more patient with them. They need because they can't really ask. They don't have the language yet to engage in a in a, in a conversation with you. But it, it it can be done with beginners. Um, the next is thanks very much. It's always good to go over something I often teach again and to learn a few more fun techniques for practicing it. Practicing it. Thanks, I appreciate that. That's good. Um, there's another question. Do you also think listening to recordings of themselves is useful? Yes, I think it is, as long as there's something else they do with it. Because uh, if you've learned this or studied a second language, you, you, you're not aware of your own problems. But when you listen to yourself and you have to a transcribe it and then analyze it for thought groups and prominence, then you realize, wow, there is something going on. But if, the, if it's difficult for the students, maybe you read to them, you read their transcription to them, what you, how you would say it, and then they can compare it. But it is definitely, it is a, a bit of time consuming exercise, but, but it is definitely uh, worthwhile doing. And again, you, could, you can have them do it as homework as, if class time is limited. Um, is, um, is uh, just this one? Yeah. I was wondering if you found that work on pronunciation has had a posi positive washback on reading. Yes, absolutely. Um, again, because you work on uh, prominence, and prominence is, it, it, these are key words that um, meaning is conveyed through. and. And, and so what, what we do in, or what I've done, I'm, I'm not teaching a reading class at the moment, but what, what I've done is I've taken a reading class, and a, sorry, a, a, a text, and they had to go home and highlight all the prominent words as homework. And then I had to bring it to class and read it out loud. And then the next thing, what I did was I did the same and, and just wrote keywords on the board. So just the prominent words, all these nouns and verbs, and the students had to look at that. And then I, I I, uh, they had to recreate the story, sort of the text, and often they were dead on. They they could understand that the meaning of this reading passage because they they, they were able to uh, sort of extrapolate or, or get the, the the meaning of of this reading passage, and that's really uh, the prominence. That's um, the power of the prominence, if you, for lack of a better word. But it does definitely help in in reading classes. Yeah. Um, now the question is, should I speak naturally or does overemphasis help students uh, identify the prominent words? Ah, that's a good question. The, the problem with speaking naturally is, um, the, of course, we, we talk about authenticity and, and natural language, but uh, the, the prominence where there's often a pitch change, uh, the, uh, not often, but there's a pitch change involved that is so subtle in the English language that you often cannot identify the prominence immediately. So you, you, for us language teachers, we tend to overemphasize things a little bit to, to help the students uh, get it. And so it is, in a sense, a little bit artificial um, particularly with low level students with with more advanced learners you want to move more into the the uh, the over you want to drift away you want to move away from that overemphasis uh, of prominence but what you what you can do is when they give what I've done with uh, advanced learners when they had to give formal presentations they had to write out the whole speech so it's, so it's a big task, but they had to write out the whole uh, presentation and then highlight all the prominent words and then get rid of all the text and just have a cheat sheet with the prominent words. And that really helped them in their, uh, in their 
delivery of it sounded much more authentic, much more uh, uh, fluent and, and natural. Uh, but it is a, a fair bit of uh, scaffolding and work in, involved there. But it, it is a good question. It's a I don't really have the exact answer to that, but it's definitely something to think about. Okay, and the last question is, um, is there a hierarchy of effective aspects of pronunciation on which to focus segmentals versus super segmentals? Ah, who? that's a, a very big question that depending on who you read, um, that's a very, very, uh, hotly debated issue in, in, in TESOL. And what it comes down to really is, the question is, what are your learners' needs? Um, so depending on who you teach, if you teach, say, Chinese learners from the southern part of China and Vietnamese and maybe some Thai learners, then you probably want to focus more on segmentals because they have issues with consonants and some vowels. Whereas if you have learners from Japan or, as I said, from Italy or maybe even French speakers, you want to focus on super segmentals because their consonants are, and vowels are they're not the same, but they're quite similar to the English uh, segmental system, but they have enormous problems with the rhythm of the English language. So you want to focus a bit more on super segmentals to help them with their pronunciation and, and ultimately intelligibility. But it is, I, I guess it goes down to the beginning, balance, like so much in, in language teaching is now balance. We need to do a bit of everything. I think it's if we do a few of the segmentless the students needs uh, need, and then a, a, some of the super segmental aspects. I think you serve the whole class well. Of course, if you've got a multicultural, uh, multilinguistic, uh, sorry, a, a multi-ethnic group of learners, some Chinese, some Saudis, some Europeans, some South Americans, then it becomes a bit more tricky because you uh, have they all have different needs. So I hope I answered this question. Uh, I might have to do a separate workshop on this later on. That's a big question. Yeah, the reference the, the reference here is the last couple of slides. Just you'll see um, some of them. This, this haptic paper is available uh, online. Some, most of them are online for free. Um, some of them not. Of, of course, that's a textbook, Celsius Messia. It's probably the most comprehensive textbook at the moment. It's, it's very American-based, but it's, a, it's just an excellent resource that can be used in, in all different contexts. Um, here's Judy Gilbert's. Oh, the link is here. So it links you straight to uh, Judy Gilbert's book. Very teacher-friendly book. It's, it's not very long. It's about, I think it's about 70 or 80 pages. Very practical, great great ideas that you can implement in your classes. And then uh, some more. Oh, there's Linda Yates uh, and then Beth Sidlinski's book. That is, uh, the link's not here, but if you Google it, it's, it's there. It's, it's available online. So some good, some good resources. Okay, I think that's it. Do you want to? All right, thanks very much for your, uh, you, it was really a, a great pleasure to do this. And if you, as I said, if you have any questions, feel free to email me. Okay, and um, I'd just like to thank everyone for coming as well. And also, once again, just to say thanks to Michael, um, we really appreciate your expertise and um, the generosity in sharing it. Um, and someone actually made a comment, which I think uh, I'll repeat now just to finish the webinar, which was it was great to think about something that we often do and to learn more techniques to go away and use tomorrow in our classrooms. So thanks, Michael, for everything. And thank you for coming. That's the end of the webinar. Very good. And that's it.